Today on Strategy Simplified, we have the pleasure of talking to Sean Treccia. Sean, a director of recruiting at KPMG, shares a lot of really great insights, including why after October 1st is your best bet for consulting recruiting at KPMG, and what things about the culture he believes are the strongest differentiators. Let's dive in. I'm excited today to introduce our team. I'm Jenny Ray LaRue from Management Consulted. As you all know, an ex bain consultant who's the facilitator of our conversations on consulting at Management Consulted. And today we have the privilege of having Sean Treccia with us. Sean is the, uh, Sean, I'll let you introduce yourself officially with your title, but I, I will call you the master of recruiting at KPMG. <laughs> and you can share just a little bit about your team, about what the team does. Uh, if you wanna give us a bit of quick background before we dive into the questions, it would be great to get to know you. You. Welcome, Sean. Sure. sure. Thank you, Jenny. And thanks everyone for joining today. Happy to be here. I don't know if I'd consider myself the master of recruiting, but I've um, been doing it for a long time. So I work for KPMG. I'm based in Chicago, actually a director on our recruiting team. For the last 15 years, my focus has been college recruiting. Uh, I lead our global recruiting program. So as a firm, we recruit separately in each country, but we do have a number of programs, at least from the student level, that cross uh, across different borders, and that's been my role leading them over the last 10 years. And recently, I took on some more roles overseeing all of our um, inclusion, diversity, and marketing and branding efforts across all levels of talent acquisition for the U.S., so not just the college side, but our experienced recruiting and our senior talent. I've been with the firm for about 15 years, have a background prior to that in sales and marketing, actually was an M uh, engineering major in undergrad for a couple of years at University of Illinois, got my MBA from Kellogg School of Business uh, Northwestern, uh, here right outside Chicago several years ago. Um, and I'm happy to be here today and happy to answer any questions you all have and, and give you a little more insight into who KPMG is, the opportunities that we have, as well as the industry in general. Amazing, we're so happy to have you. So we're gonna start with a couple of rapid fire fun questions, and then we're gonna dive into the questions that are more professional and serious about KPMG. So the first one is the first place that you will travel post COVID and why? Uh, well, the first place I would say would be Scandinavia, probably Copenhagen, because I was supposed to have a program there this summer. Um, and my family was supposed to come and we were going to spend two weeks in Scandinavia, a place none of us had ever been. And it got canceled because of COVID. So that would be top on our list. I think I still have a credit from British Airways. So that would be number one. Follow up question. Would you go in the winter or only in the summer? Ooh. Well, we all like to ski, so I think we'd be willing to go in the winter um, and go a little further north so we could do some skiing. Fantastic. Okay, I love it. Good. Second question, your favorite quarantine activity? Uh, I Mine has been kind of a, a watching activity, and that's with my, I'm a big cook. I love to do the cooking for our family, but we've created a process now where our kids cook a meal one night a week. And for me, staying out and not helping them has been the big fun activity watching for once a week where i don't have to cook and clean up and make dinner for everyone but i get to sit back uh, has been a lot of fun that's a great question so i have a follow-up to that one too what is the best sure. meal they've made and what was the bottom of the barrel <laughs> um, I would say their hamburgers they made were amazing. They were a little big, like almost a pound each, um, but they were really good. Uh, some of the stuff, they tried to make some fizzy drink that was ended up being like drinking straight sugar. Um, they ended way too much sugar, so that was not great. Uh, but their burgers were really good. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. That gives me ideas for my family. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, okay, yeah. the third one is, a, you, you give us a little bit of your background, but what's a career that you could have pursued but didn't pursue? So interesting there, um, I would say engineering because I, I was a civil engineering major my first two years at University of Illinois, and, part, and I had two internships after. And part of the reason I changed out of it is I said, I don't want a job where I have to be in front of a computer all day. I wanna get out and do more and I really enjoy sports. Someone said, you should go into sports marketing. So my bachelor's degree is actually in kinesiology. Sports marketing is my focus. Um, 
I never ended up getting a job in that. And now I spend most of my day in front of computers. So I look back and like engineering pays a lot more than recruiting. Why didn't I stay there? Um, but no, I love what I do now. Um, I still do have friends who are engineers. And when I talk to my counterparts who are accountants, especially, and they talk about their hard accounting classes, I'm like, hey, I passed through three levels of calculus and differential equations. So don't get me started on your tough algebra class. So. So that that will answer one of my later questions, which is around oh is KPMG open to non-traditional degrees, mm -hmm. right? Do you have to have a business yes. degree? Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, okay. okay, great. Number four, the biggest risk you've taken that's paid off. I, I think I, I grouped these into risks of I, I mentioned earlier that I like to cook. I will try any kind of food. Um, and because of that, I, there's so many things I love. There's some things I don't like. I don't like sun-dried tomatoes or olives, which are pretty basic. But I, because I've tried so many different things, now my kids last week were asking when I could make octopus tacos for them again. Because I had octopus when I was in Portugal. I loved it. Now they love it. They sell it at Costco. And so I toss it on the grill and make tacos. And I mean, I have a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old who are begging for more octopus tacos. So I think that risk of being willing to try new things and not always tell them what it is. Um, I don't want to know what it is sometimes, but then you end up loving it. Some things, some, some things I won't eat again, but. I love that. I, I don't think that I've met a, a, a 10 year old that wants octopus tacos <laughs> before. So that's a really great gift. Okay, great. Last, and I would say the most important question is Chicago deep dish versus New York style pizza. I'm going to need three points of justification for whatever your answer is here. Mm. Sure, it, it, this is a good one. and. Um, I am from Chicago, I've grown up here. I will say Chicago deep dish is my favorite, but it's mood It's mood dependent. For those who haven't had Chicago deep dish, one piece is a meal by itself. So there's times, if I've been out with friends or we're having a drink, you come home, I love grabbing a slice of New York pizza, walking back in New York to a, my hotel and grabbing a slice for $2 and that's great. So there's times I love New York pizza, but if I want a meal sitting down, I want the Chicago deep dish. But again, that one piece after that, you're then like tired and want to go to sleep. So I love them both for different reasons. That's a very politically correct <laughs> answer. I appreciate that. That's, a, that's such a consulting demonstrated yes. answer. Yes. <laughs> both are great options. It just mm -hmm. depends on what the situation depends is. Depends on the mood, right, right. Amazing. Well, great. Sean, are there any of those questions or a different fun question that you want to ask me before we kick off into the more serious questions? Uh, I guess a fun one. You talked at the beginning that you, you've been able to travel a lot. So where is one place you're anxious to get back to traveling to once COVID is, is behind us? I love that. One of my, the things that I've seen change in my travel desires or travel behaviors in the last couple of months since I've been longing for international travel is a desire to be outside more. And so whereas normally I would travel to cities and look for an urban experience and look for, you know, biking and riverside eating or seaside eating and kind of, you know, a, an immersive city experience, I've had an increased desire in the wanting to be outside. So one of yeah. the things on my bucket list that I've moved up in COVID is to do at least a piece of the Camino in Spain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so because of the fact that it's mostly outside, you can either camp or, um, you know, stay in, in places that are, are quite like low contact. I think that's one of the places that I have changed the order of that I would like to do. Right I now. like that. That's very good. Adapting to the current environment. I like that. That's exactly right. Awesome. Well, Sean, it's great to get to know you a little bit. That that really will make the rest of this conversation uh, fun and insightful. I get to see a little bit of who you are now. And what we want to talk about are three sections of the conversation. So the first one is recruiting trends. This is top of mind for everyone. So we want to know a little bit about what is going on in the inner workings of KPMG right now, what you guys are thinking and talking about, what is top of mind, how you're thinking about candidates, what's changed. There are 
there's just so many top of mind questions there. And so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about that. Sure. Uh, after that, we just want to hear a little bit about the firm. Mm -hmm. you, you have a unique perspective when you're thinking about building the next class of folks for KPMG about where the firm is going and what the firm is thinking right now. And then the final thing is just why KPMG? We want to hear about you from your perspective, and we want to hear about what you think makes somebody a great fit for KPMG and what makes KPMG a great fit for them. So I'm going to start off with a couple of the recruiting trends, and sure. then we'll go forward from there. So the first one, can you talk a little bit about core school recruiting? This has been a standard hallmark of the way that we've done recruiting forever and ever. And this year, Zoom is your new core school, but is it? We want to understand a little bit about how you are thinking about defining core schools and if you've changed your thoughts about that related to this fall's recruiting season. Sure, great question. Um, we we have always had core schools, uh, different levels. We, we have three different levels kind of of the schools we focus on. Um, and this fall, we're going to be virtual at every school, uh, at least in the US and most other countries too. We're going to be virtual ever. We're not going physically back to any school. But we're still keeping the focus on the core schools because those are the ones where we've gotten the best return on investment. And once we go back live, need to continue to maintain strong relationships. So we are grouping them into, when we look at a, a virtual event, um, I'll pick schools close to Chicago that I know, so University of Notre Dame. University of Notre Dame has always had a dedicated recruiter for us. They will still have a dedicated recruiter. We will run specific virtual events for the University of Notre Dame, where only Notre Dame students are invited, similar for many of our other core schools. But because we do want to expand our reach beyond those, we will host other events and activities for students from other schools, but they will be combined. So a smaller school we may not expect a lot of hires from, we will combine them with maybe six, seven other schools. Because even though we're saving costs by not going in or virtually, we're not getting more people to do recruiting. So you still can't run 75 different events. And the other thing we have to face realistically is our, our competitors. And at Notre Dame, it is much more competitive for us because there's a lot of other firms doing very similar things to us. And at some of the smaller schools, maybe not as many companies are there. So grouping them in, maybe make it sit still a, a reasonable resource for us to get some. Um, so that's the plan right now. We're, we're, we've launched everything about a week ago as schools started to get back into session. Okay, can I ask a follow-up question to that of one? Of course, of course. The question is just related to, you mentioned you have these three categories of schools, and I don't know if I heard mm -hmm. super clearly what those are. Can you just run us through those again so that sure. I can make sure I understand? Yep. So when we set up schools, the, the first category of schools for us are, and I'm guessing other employers are very similar, is what we would call a national premier school. And this is a school that will source multiple offices as well as multiple groups. So we hire with an audit. Uh, we have four different groups in audit. We have 15 different groups in tax and 30 different groups in our consulting. Um, so a, a key national school, I'll, I'll pick on Notre Dame again, just because it's local here, um, will source many offices, many groups. Then we have what we call a locally important school. So we have offices, no offense if any of you live in Boise, Idaho, but there aren't a lot of students who want to go to Boise, Idaho. So we have to recruit at Boise State or local schools around there in order to get students to fill the positions in Boise. So it's an important school for us, but realistically, we're not gonna find a lot of students there who want to go elsewhere. And then our third tier are what we call our virtual schools. Schools either in locations where it just doesn't make sense for us to go, or they don't provide a lot of return on investment, but we still like the students there because maybe they have the, a unique major that we only hire a few for, or they're a, a, a school that gives us a different type of background or diversity or technology or something. So we tend to focus on that third tier with more virtual events. So that's how we, we tier our schools. That's incredible. And the, did the virtual schools exist before this year or is that a new tier? <sighs> So they did. Um, we didn't do things as much virtual as we would do more what we would call a posting only, meaning we would post our jobs at those school. Listen, I think one of the things that has benefited us from this is when you post jobs at a school but never recruit there, you're not going to get the necessarily great return on investment or necessarily the best students because you don't really know who you are. You're just another company, and especially if we're out west in the U.S., they think we're a radio station. KPMG is, if you're not a business major, who are you? So. 
um, the virtual component has really helped us. And we started that a little pre-COVID, probably in January, doing more virtual events for these schools, getting to help them to know who we were. I love that. Okay, awesome. Well, the the second one is, can you just talk about some of the KPMG specific recruiting trends that are happening mm -hmm. um, 2021 hires? And um, even if you have them 2022 projections or if, if it's real and true for you right now, what you're doing right now for real time hiring. Um, sure. And if you're able to, if, if it's different across levels, feel free to share it that mm -hmm. way. If it's just broader and more across them, then that's also great. Sure. Um, wanna, one thing to set the stage for all of you that'll help give you some background with this, our fiscal year ends September 30th. So for us, we're approaching the end of our fiscal year. We're a partnership, meaning we're owned by partners. So it's probably not surprising if any of you have worked a partnership. We're pretty much in a hiring freeze for the next six weeks because partners make their money on where the, year, the firm ends up at year end. Our year end is September 30th. So there's a hiring freeze right now. That's not unusual this time of year. Doesn't mean we're stopped recruiting. So we started looking at our numbers for the next fiscal year, which starts October 1st. Um, and what we're seeing is a definite um, flat to slight increases in, in certain areas. Our tax work continues to grow, uh, some of it through tax regulations that is going on with organizations, but just as companies look to sell or move out parts, they have different tax implications, so that is a big change. Uh, the audit work is fairly steady uh, to where it's been in the past. The consulting work is kind of all over. There's anticipation that there's going to be a lot of consulting needs coming once companies are fully back letting us on site and meeting the work. A lot of companies, and you all have probably seen this, have put projects on hold. So we've got a big pipeline of projects waiting to happen, um, but uh, and uh, some of them can be done virtually. I'd say the biggest area that's that's facing a challenge right now is our, our deal advisory group. So that's the mergers and acquisitions group, because a lot of companies just aren't buying other companies right now, or even selling off others because they're just holding on that. So that's a group that we hire a lot of people from in our consulting group that's kind of just on hold, not sure. They know they're gonna need a lot, they're just not sure when it's gonna happen. The technology related projects, some of the more strategy related projects, those are still continuing because those can be done virtually. But our, our other challenge we're facing going forward is the changing skill set of what we need. Uh, we still, about 50% of the people we hire are into our audit practice. And to work in audit, you have to have a, a, an accounting degree and be a CPA license, or eventually get your CPA license. But what we're finding is that we need auditors with mm -hmm. other skills, with mm -hmm. technology skills, with data and analytics skills. The challenge is the audit profession is regulated by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as the Public Accounting Oversight or the PCAOB, um, the federal government. And there's restrictions in who can work an audit that the government sets. So that's one of the things all of the firms are trying to figure out, all of the large accounting firms, is how do you hire technology people into an audit practice when they can't be a C, they won't get their CPA license, but the government says if you work on audit, you have to have a CPA. So there's a lot of challenge that we're working on. Some of it's internal and in how you code people, but really trying to change the mindset of what we're looking for. Computers do so much for us now. We don't need the old fashioned accountant green with a green visor on typing numbers in that. That's for the IRS or something now. We need people who can talk to clients, who can build relationships, who understand data, analytics, technology, strategy, accounting, all of that. One of the biggest challenges with interview preparation for consulting is knowing what you don't know. And the best way to figure that out is to work with an expert coach. You can work with someone on our team for just one session where they can give you ideas for where you can build your prep, or you can work with them for eight or more sessions to make sure that you're 100% ready for interview day. Check it out at managementconsulted.com. Sean, I have a, a follow-up question that I want to sure. add in for that one. By the way, that was really helpful just to understand how you're thinking about everything. Just to be uh, clear, especially on the professional services, but more specifically the consulting side, mm -hmm. with that backlog, does that mean that you're holding off on some hiring and waiting until you have more certainty about yep. the pipeline? Or so do, can we expect almost like a split year where we have some hiring now and some hiring in the spring? And, and just tell us a little bit more about what that might Sure. Like if that's the yeah, case. I think there's definitely going to be a split. Um, in fact, our, our experienced hire group, so the one that hires people who already have experience as opposed to the college recruiting, um, is anticipating a 
big push come February, March, um, that right now most of their positions are on hold because they're able to do the work that our clients need with the people we currently have. The other thing that we're facing um, is there's no turnover. And an industry like ours actually expects turnover. That's how we create roles and things open up and nobody's leaving because there's nowhere for them to go. So we know that come March, February, March, assuming COVID gets better and all that, people will leave because that's natural. We understand that. And then we're going to need to backfill a lot of those. So we anticipate coming the spring, late winter, early spring, a lot of hiring needs because a lot of companies themselves that would typically want us to do work, want to first meet and say, come on, how, come in house, let's talk. But they're not allowing us into their facility either because they're not open. So everything's kind of in that holding pattern for a little while. We'll be right back after this quick break. Have you ever heard a new digital trend and thought to yourself, okay, does this really matter? Asking the right questions helps you cut through the noise and get down to what matters most. I'm Jim Hertzfeld, host of the What If So What podcast, where we discover what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real by asking what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Subscribe and listen, and together we can turn big ideas into tangible actions so you can get shit done. At this point, is there a point when you see, think some of those conversations will just change? They'll say, let's just do this virtually. <laughs> or, uh, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm curious about that point of urgency at some point. I, I feel like there are some industries that have begun to say, you know what, we're just going to mm-hmm. do our training or we're just going to do our implementation and we're just going to do it like we can do it. And there are others that are still holding off. Just curious about your I think that's, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know when it will all happen, but it's it started already. We have 85 offices in the U.S. Our plan is to not open any of them officially until January 1st, well, January 2nd or whatever the first day. Um, but we're going to start testing some of them. But their plan also is to not renew the leases at the same levels because we're just not going to need as many people and to stop re- the expectation of having people at the client five days a week. Now, you're not going to need to be at the client five days a week. Um, so starting to have those conversations on and getting to understand from the client, well, what's working, what's not. Clients in a business like ours, clients pay for us to be there. So if if I'm based in Chicago and I have to go to a client in Detroit, the client's paying my travel. That's part of the engagement there. Well, if the client is looking at it now saying, you know what, Sean, you can do that work from your home in Chicago. Why are we paying for your flight and hotel for six weeks in Detroit? We'll just have you do it from home. So from a client standpoint, they are looking at that as a way to save money also. So it's a mix of what can be done on site, what maybe starts on site and then moves off. Uh, And those are the engagements that have been going really well are the ones that started pre-COVID. We built a relationship, things are going. It's harder to start the brand new ones that we've never physically met people. Love that. Well, let me just finish up with one final question about recruiting. Sure. Why do you do recruiting? Why is this what you love? And why is KPMG a organization or a brand that you enjoy representing? Sure. Uh, great question. And it kind of gets to something I said a little earlier. I didn't know college recruiting originally existed as a job. Um, I, as I said, was engineering background, thought I wanted to do sports marketing, didn't end up doing it, did sales and marketing. Then after getting my MBA uh, at Northwestern, thought, okay, I really want to do marketing. I came to KPMG as a marketing manager for our tax practice, uh, and I hated it. It was horrible. Marketing professional services, especially tax, just was not fun. Um, But I really liked the culture of the organization. What I liked was that a professional services organization, we don't produce anything. Our only asset are our people, for the most part. We produce a few little products, but for the most part, it's our people. So what I saw was an organization that had great benefits for their people, that did a ton of training for their people and investment in career development and technology and all these wonderful things for their people. And so I said, well, I'd like to stay at KPMG, but I don't want to stay in marketing. I happen to sit near the people in college recruiting. And as I talked to them, realized that at least for college recruiting, what you do is marketing. You're just marketing jobs to students. You're a marketer, you're an event planner, you're that, and you're doing that to students instead of marketing Kraft Mac and Cheese to parents or marketing Toyotas to car buyers. I'm marketing jobs to students, or now it's beyond students, but any employee. So I made that move 
15 years ago about, and I've had the opportunity to stay. I, I enjoy what I'm doing, and what's kept me at KPMG is the continued opportunities to stay and grow. So I was a Chicago manager, a Midwest person. Now I manage the global programs and taking on diversity and marketing. And it's been the opportunity that KPMG gives you to, to expand your horizons. If you want to do other things, raising your hand and say, hey, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. It may not come tomorrow, but if, you, if you're if you willing to do some of that, those opportunities have opened up. Um, and, and that's why I've stayed and I really enjoy it and, and think it's been a great career for me as well as the others who've, who've joined. I love that. Well, let's talk a little bit about KPMG right now. Mm -hmm. Our focus in this is to try to bring back the veil of this behemoth organization. Yeah. Because when people think about KPMG, like you even just mentioned, you had two different experiences mm -hmm. in two different roles that were doing two different things inside KPMG. KPMG doesn't equal KPMG. Right. And so what we'd like to understand is some of the practice areas or the capabilities sure. inside KPMG that are growing right now where students can think about mm -hmm building their careers maybe more actively or might have more of a shot to yep. get into KPMG. Can you talk a little bit about that? Of course. Happy to. Um, I mentioned this briefly earlier, but we divide our business into three, into audit, tax, and we call it advisory, but it's consulting, same thing. Um, the audit business is relatively flat, um, slight growth, one to two, three percent growth. Tax, and I know that may not be of interest to a lot of people on here, but just, you know, tax is growing a lot. There's a lot of opportunities to tax, um, but also for tax technology. I mentioned earlier, technology is related to tax for countries, for government, for organizations. So while that may not be interest to a lot of people, that is a very fast growing area. Um, and then on the consulting side, the, the growth areas are in some of the areas you would expect. A lot of cybersecurity, um, a lot of strategy consulting, especially in operating in a global environment that is able to withstand changes in governments. Because if you would have asked a couple of years ago, you're on a big project dealing with a client that's in the US, the UK and France, you say, oh, it's great. We got the European Union, everything works well. You know what? The UK quit the European Union. So you have to develop companies or how do they manage that strategy? You know, the I won't get into politics, but whoever the president is of the United States makes a difference in what we have to face and what our clients have to face um, different governments around the world who who change at, at various points. So there's a lot of work. Most clients we work on are global in nature, with the exception of some of the federal government or state and local clients. Um, and so opportunities for people who can work cross borders, who understand different cultures, a lot on the technology side, security, a lot on different financing ways on how companies are going to finance. Um, whether it's Bitcoin or things like that, how we don't get paid in Bitcoin as a firm, um, but how do you deal with clients who want to start selling a product and get paid on that product via Bitcoin? Um, that's a project. How are you going to manage that from a technology standpoint, from a strategy? Where do you set up different operations as the EU goes through a lot of different things you've seen in the news when they're looking at companies like Google and they're setting up here so they're not passing their profits through the right area so then their back taxes of billion dollars, whatever it is. Um, that's all all areas that we are, are trying to work on. A lot of it on the, the cross border and mixing of companies and the partnerships area. It, are there specific names if people are looking up roles or responsibilities of those practice areas that you just mentioned? Um, I'd say anything with cyber, with data analytics um, are big ones. I, the one that is not right now is transformation, mainly because of COVID. I would say transformation will become big after COVID, but right now there's really not much transformation or strategy work going on. Uh, but it, it's a lot of it is around um, security, cybersecurity, physical security, um, and then using data and analytics uh, as well as just general technology opportunities. Perfect, I love it. Well, then the second and final question for this piece is, how should future applicants be investing in themselves? What what kind of skills do those big, fast-growing divisions look for tactically? Is it degrees? Is it experience? Is it coding technology? Uh, is there some mix of those together? What is it in particular yeah. that makes someone an attractive candidate, and what should they build? I definitely say the, the technology, the 
technical specifics. And when I say technical, I don't mean computer technical. I mean about a specific area. So if you want to work in finance or as a financial consultant type, make sure you really understand all the latest financial instruments. And I'm not an expert on some of this, but how derivatives work or Bitcoin or all those. If you want to be an SAP programmer, make sure you understand that. But something people forget is that in a business like ours, we don't have salespeople. Um, we, we have marketing people who help develop things. But our salespeople are our consultants, are our client facing people, our audit tax advisory people, our partners become partner because they can sell and bring in business. So if you want to make the money at a consulting firm, um, and it's not just KPMG, any of the big four, and I guess similar to when you were at Bain, similar to that, you have to help bring in business. And so it's not just about doing the work, but can you communicate what you're doing to someone who's not an expert in it? Because ultimately, at most organizations, the CFO is probably going to have to pay the bill for any kind of project. Well, the CFO is probably an accountant by trade. That's that he or she is not an SAP programmer. So how are you going to get them to spend $5 million on an SAP project? You have to explain the project to them in a way that makes sense to them. And I think some people get very focused on, well, I know this area very well. Well, that's great. You'd be a great manager or worker be kind of doing the work. But if you want to truly grow and lead teams and lead projects, it's about the ability to communicate effectively to the client with what we're doing, but also manage your team. Um, the people who grow manage strong teams and get the most out of their teams. I mentioned earlier, we're a people business. Managing people is not easy because people get sick, they get married, they have babies, they get divorced, they have vacations. There's all those things. Well, you have to manage that. Work isn't going to just magically get done. You can't just press a button and it's done. You need to manage your people. So I'd say people who can show the ability to work with others, to lead teams, to communicate well outside of their core group who they've worked with. Those things are really important. I love that. Well, now I wanna move on to why KPMG? And we've talked a little bit about why for you, uh, you got into this mm -hmm. role. But the first question that you mentioned earlier that they're competitors, we'll just keep them mm -hmm. nameless for a moment. But these, these mystical competitors, uh, when you're sharing with somebody about why KPMG and not another mm -hmm. firm, you don't have to articulate what specific right. firm, but what is it in particular that you share that you think really resonates with people? Sure, that's a great question. And I, I won't say which one, but if you look me up on LinkedIn. I did work at one of the other firms, uh, one, of, one of the large accounting firms, I should say. I didn't work at one of the consulting firms. Um, the difference, and it's, it's tough, is it comes down to the people at the organization. And, and I know that's a nebulous word. And people are like, oh, stop telling me it's the people. But again, all we have are our people, um, at least among the big four, so Pricewaterhouse, Deloitte, and Ernst Young, and KPMG. We pay the same, our clients are the same, our career paths are the same, our locations throughout the world are the same, our technologies. There isn't going to be a difference there. Where you're going to find the difference is the culture of the organization. And what I would say is KPMG's culture, compared to the other one I worked at, is a little more entrepreneurial. That can be good or bad. The good part of it is it's helped someone like me in my career because I've wanted to do more things. So I can raise my hand and make moves very easily around different groups. The challenge with that is if you're not willing to raise your hand, if you just sit back and wait, you will only get the path that they put you on which may be fine, but it may not be what you want. And some people want a more defined career path. The other organization I worked at um, had a very set defined career path and they didn't really like you to deviate from that, which was great for them. It didn't work for me. But so I think part of that is understanding yourself and what's important to you. And then it's talking to people. Um, I joke, but you know, everyone always loves the recruiters who they meet. That's great, but you're not going to work with me. I hope I represent the firm accurately. I think I do. But talk to people who work there, people who currently work there, people who haven't worked there or who have worked there and don't anymore about what they like and what they don't like, because that'll give you a real impression of, of any consulting firm, because it's really you're going to spend hours and hours working with these people. The projects won't vary that dramatically from one company to another, but the people you work with, do you trust these people? Do they have the same values as you? I wouldn't say our values are better than any other firm. They may be just slightly different. Uh, and all the firms out there are wonderful. I, I, you can be successful at any one of them. I love that. 
the entrepreneurial nature, sometimes people uh, maybe misinterpret that to be that they have to have started a company. Can you talk about how somebody can demonstrate that they're entrepreneurial without having started sure. a company? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think I'm a perfect example. I didn't start a company, um, but I started our global programs that I lead started um, myself and one of my counterparts 10 years ago. We just looked at it, realized that KPMG is a global firm, but we never talked to KPMG in other countries. Um, at least from a recruiting standpoint. We had clients that would do, but recruiting we never did. And we felt that there would be some, that students were interested in, in international rotations and those kind of things, so what could we do? So we came up with some ideas of a global training program, a case competition, and then started reaching out to other member firms and, and just asking partners we knew in the US, hey, do you know a partner in London who can connect me with an HR person there, or someone in Germany who can connect me with an HR person, and starting to build those relationships to ultimately where we've built these programs, the one I finished earlier this week, for our 15th year, our KPMG Ideation Challenge, a global case competition we do that just finished. Um, it, it's been wonderful, and what it showed to my superiors and my bosses is that I could build something from scratch, that I could take something that didn't exist and I had the ideas. It wasn't a new company, but it was a new program and something we were doing for students. And it also made my job exciting because honestly, when I joined recruiting as a Chicago recruiter, that was fine. I would have been bored out of my mind doing that for 15 years. I couldn't have done that. But because I've looked at new opportunities and created some for myself, whereas others, others have created and I just raised my hand, can I help with that? Sometimes the answer has been no, but others have been yes. So I think when I say entrepreneurial, it's willing to try new things. They don't necessarily have to be your idea. They can be somebody else's, but tap into those ideas and don't say, well, I was hired to do this and this is all I do. With hiring and decline, you don't stand a chance of landing a role in this competitive landscape without a killer resume. We have an expert team that will review and refine your resume. Work with us today at managementconsulted.com. I want to ask a specific question about consulting, and I hope that this sure. is is uh, you know good for a focus area. But because a lot of our audience is interested in consulting, because of KPMG's relationship in the consulting space, and the fact that you have largely an internal consulting practice, whereas some of the other peers that you have have purchased uh, mm -hmm. for Deloitte Monitor for. Mm -hmm. Parthenon EY, or yep. for EY Parthenon, sorry. Um, so I, what I'm curious about is just how that uh, internal strategy function, you feel like what the pros and cons are of the fact that the the strategy consulting piece is, has been internally built. In, and that's uh, a great question. And, and, and that's something our leaders have talked about um, often to us is, do we go out and purchase? Um, we've made several purchases, but they've been more on the uh, accounting side and less on the consulting yeah. side. And so it's, do we purchase another consulting firm or do we grow from within? There's, there's probably no right answer, there, but they have chosen to do the growth from within because what they have found is that we have been challenged when people come into the organization from the outside, not just organization that we purchase, but with them, there we, we track length of stay and performance. We've had much more success with people who grow up through KPMG, who we've hired as interns or full-time people than people who come in from the outside. Doesn't mean they don't succeed. We have plenty who have succeeded. Um, but what they have found is they've been more successful if they've grown up with the firm. So the feeling is if we could hire more people early and help them understand our culture and the way we do things, that would help us build a client base that we can manage and that has the right people working on it better than doing an integration with an external company. Now we've done integrations. As I said, we purchased uh, Ross and Cass, which was a smaller accounting firm. There've been other um, purchases, but we do a consulting side. They have just decided they wanted to grow that internally. I'm not in the exact meetings where they discuss that. I'm not sure. I've paid for that, um, but that is a, a conscious decision. And, and they have raised our, our new chairman. So our previous chairman, Lynn, retired this summer. Our new chairman, Paul, has said they're always willing to explore that. And they are looking at purchasing external organizations where it makes sense in specific markets, but they would not do a large but they would do a specific market. Okay, we want to get into consulting in this industry and we don't have expertise there, so we may go after that. Those are the types of things they look at more than just broad consulting. 
Okay, that's helpful. Well, I have two final questions. The sure. first one is for our audience. So if somebody is applying for a role at KPMG, what's one great piece of advice that you have in order to help them best succeed in their application? So the best advice I would give um, is to try to connect with someone who, and I mentioned her, who's already working there or who has who's worked there in the past, um, because we get a number of applications. But if you can make that connection, not only does it help you understand the firm, because we write job descriptions, but I'll be honest, our lawyers write a lot of the job descriptions. So there's a lot of legal words in there that you're like, this doesn't mean anything. And like, I know, because sorry to any of you who are lawyers on there. Um, but you really get the, the inside scoop from talking to someone who's done it. Um, and what they do, but they can also help refer you. We love employee referrals. We would prefer to get most of our hires from employee referrals because the feeling is if we hire someone, you're working really well and you have a friend who you recommend, you're probably not gonna recommend someone who's bad because that would look bad on you. So if you're gonna recommend someone who's good, we would love that. So it doesn't mean that's the only way to get in, but making those connections through people you've met at school, through jobs, even just reaching out on LinkedIn is a great way to make that connection and help you know about the firm and help the firm get to know about you. I love that. So you really do value the opinions of your people. Oh yes, most definitely. The last question is you've been at KPMG for a number of years and you've seen changes inside the organization. What are one or two of your favorite surprises about the way that KPMG has handled something, whether it's an economic downturn, the crisis mm -hmm. that we're going through right now, just sure. hiring, you mentioned diversity and inclusion earlier. Yeah. I'd love to know a little bit about how it, this just actions that the organization or specific people even have taken that have really impressed you. I think one that really impressed me was when our previous chairman, chairwoman was named Lynn. And again, she finished up her five year term and retired, um, but she didn't come from the audit background. She was advisor. She was consulting. She was audit her first like three years of her career, but hadn't been an audit in 25 years. And I never thought they would name a chairman who wasn't an audit person. Um, and I was impressed that they did that. And I think she really helped us grow um, and, and brought a new perspective rather than audit, which is a very compliance heavy business. She really helped us. Um, one of her, her mottos she had when she came in was fail fast. They're coming in saying, look, we're going to fail. But in audit, you can't have that methodology because you can't fail or the government will get you in trouble and you'll have all sorts of problems. You'll turn it into Arthur Anderson. Um, so we have to be careful of that on the audit side. But she really brought us, I think, moving forward uh, in growing our business. Uh, audit grew, but grew all of our businesses, which I really liked. The other thing that I've been really impressed with is the commitment to hiring. So whether it was the downturn in 08, 09, or what we're going through right now, um, our hiring numbers have not dropped dramatically. I referenced this earlier, but um, they did put a freeze on for the last few months of the fiscal year, which happens in a partnership sometimes. But we have our tax hiring numbers for next year, and they're above this current year. We have our audit hiring numbers, and they're the same as they were in 2019. We have our consulting numbers, and they're only down 2%. Um, and we thought, I was anticipating they'd be down a lot more. Um, and again, that's the campus numbers. We don't have the experience numbers yet, but at least the from MBA, law school, and all the student numbers. Um, and because the firm has realized, I'm really impressed that when they go through these downturns, and this is my second downturn to go through um, in the economy with the firm, is that they recognize that as a people business, you need to continue to bring in those people. Because when things don't turn around, if we don't have the people there, then the clients are gonna hire Deloitte, they're gonna hire Bain, they're gonna hire Accenture, they're gonna hire someone else. So even if we don't have work for people right now, training and development of those people is really important. So bringing them in, training and developing them really matters. I love that. Thank you, Sean. We really appreciate you. Thank you so, so much for your time. We value it a lot. It was really insightful and honestly just fun to talk to you. So thanks again for joining us today. And we'll look forward to seeing great things from KPMG in the year to come. Very good. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Absolutely. Thanks for joining Strategy Simplified. We hope that you enjoy this conversation with Sean as much as we did. We are really excited to stay in touch, so please subscribe to this channel, make sure that you leave us a positive review, and feel free to reach out to us at team at managementconsulted.com if you have great ideas for future podcasts or yourself would like to be on the podcast. We are so appreciative of our amazing community. Thanks for being a part of it.